let me tell you about my Jesus, the Jesus of Scripture, not a fairy tale, the real Jesus who died for our sins on the cross, who rose from the dead. As we look at the crossroads of the cross, the eternal destiny of two thieves, crucified along with Jesus, they converged, that meant they came together at that cross, and then they diverged, which means they went in separate directions at the crossroads of the cross. The eternal destiny of sinners today converge at the cross, and they diverge at the cross as well. So yes, I want us to think carefully and prayerfully and to act appropriately regarding our eternal destiny at the cross. That Jesus came to satisfy the demands of righteous, holy God, as well as loving and merciful, merciful uh, holy God when he came at, into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and then at the cross by that Friday and the empty tomb on the third day. The crucifixion confronts you and me with eternal destiny. It reminds us of living life with the eternal perspective as well as, as I just said, eternal destiny. We do well to reflect, consider, pray about, act upon, and set it once and for all, perhaps even today. The Bible tells us in John 19, verses 17 through 18, And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side, and Jesus in the center. And then Isaiah 53, 12. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he will divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So right this moment, I want us to consider the convergence at the crossroads of the cross. The Bible says in Mark 15, With him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right, the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. So we ask ourselves a very important question is, then what did the two thieves, the two criminals, have in common at the cross? As we think about that, I'll share some things with you. Number one, both men were rebels. The word transgressors means that they were of very nature lawbreakers. They were, as the language of the New Testament tells us or teaches us, unlawful and therefore wicked, violators of the law. They had been arrested in connection with Barabbas. Barabbas obviously was chosen in the place of Jesus. Or you could say that Jesus took Barabbas' place on the cross, just as Jesus took your place and my place on that same cross. They were violators of the law of God by being robbers. Obviously, stealing and robbing is a breaking of the commandment of God. By being rebels, even, going against society, that they were violators of the law of God. They had broken the very commandment that God had given to Moses. You shall not steal. Exodus 20, verse 15. And Leviticus 19, it's expanded a little bit. You shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another. And you shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not cheat your neighbor, nor rob him. They were violators of the law of God. But they were also violators of the laws of Caesar, or rather the Roman government. Dr. Stephen Miller says that the two men, the, the thieves, the criminals, if you want to use that word, there's a Greek word that is used to describe them, it's the same word used in connection to Barabbas, and that meant revolutionaries, bandits, criminal. 
So basically, these were two criminals who very likely uh, did their deeds, that is, breaking and entering, perhaps used violence of all kinds against unsuspecting people. And they did it in the name of, oh, well, we're resisting the Roman Empire, but it was just an excuse for them to rob and steal and cheat, who knows, maybe killed. And the Roman government, of course, said, we're making an example out of you. Just as God's law says, the soul that sinneth shall surely die. Both men were, as I said, rebels. But both men were also revilers. That is, they cursed Jesus. They mocked him. They blasphemed him. They reproached Jesus as he hung on the cross. And in that regard, they're no different from the crowd that's doing the same thing. Those who are passing by, shaking their head. Ain't it a shame he can save others, but he can't save himself. Others who would shout out, if you're the Messiah, if you're the Savior, save yourself. Come down from the cross. We believe you did. Come on, do it. Show us something. I, I paraphrase that, obviously. Others were shouting, like in Matthew uh, 27, through 39 and 43, he saved others. Himself, he cannot save. And one of the, th both thieves started out cursing Jesus. But one of them, it is recorded what he said. And that is found, I believe, in Luke 23, 39. If you're the Christ, save yourself and us. They were revilers. They were rebels. Both men were reprobates. That is, they were bad to the core. Or like the song, Bad to the Bone. They were justly condemned to death. And when death would come for them, they were justifiably condemned to spend an eternity separated from God in a devil's hell. They probably hung there insulting Jesus like the crowd was doing because maybe they saw him or thought of him as a flawed Messiah. You know, he had preached about the kingdom of God. He had performed amazing miracles. He had healed the sick, given sight to the blind, restored hearing to those who were deaf, opened the mouths of those who were unable to speak, cast out demons, and even raised the dead. And he's hanging on a cross. Wow, there's a disconnect. At one time, he seemed untouchable by the Jewish authorities, by the Roman authorities. And now he's hanging on the cross. They probably thought he was a dreamer, misguided, somebody who did not live up to their expectations of what Messiah or Savior ought to be, a warrior king. I mean, he had not established the kingdom of David. He had not brought peace to the people of Israel. He had not uh, stirred up prosperity. None of those things. He hadn't even brought about revival, at least from their point of view. See, they didn't understand that Jesus had to be the suffering servant before he comes as the conquering king. They likely insulted Jesus thinking him to be a failed Messiah for the same reasons. Think about it. Jesus is hanging on the cross. He has been despised. He's been spit upon. He has been beaten. He has been scourged. He has been nailed to a cross. He has been humiliated. Hanging there, he looks to be like he is an utter contemptible failure. Wow. The very one who had called those to come to him and cast their burden to him was helpless to prevent this act. Helpless to save himself. Helpless to come down from the cross. Think for one moment though, Jesus could have. He had no, no problem with accomplishing that. But had he done so, you and I would not be able to be saved. Psalm 22 gives us the perspective from the cross as Jesus hangs there in essence saying that I've been surrounded by dogs and bulls and they, they, uh, they pat out the lip. You know, they say, well, let, let God delight in him since uh, you know, he delights in God. He saved others himself. He cannot save him. Jesus uh, is in that moment. That's what David foresaw. In fact, Jesus will even cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Quoting scripture, when he bears the sin of all of us and he is alienated from the Father in that moment, just taking our place because that alienation is what you and I deserve. Jesus on the cross in that moment appeared to be more of a martyr than a Messiah. 
So we ask ourselves the question, and a very important question. What do we have in common with the criminals, the two criminals at the cross? Well, like the two criminals, you and I, we are criminal at heart. We rebel against God. We are utterly reprobate toward against God. John Calvin had a wonderful word. He calls it utter depravity. I translate it this way, rotten to the core. There's nothing within us that is good. You and I are justifiably condemned before holy God. And we deserve eternal separation from God. We are violators of God's law. And who knows, some of us here may be violators of man's law today. And like the two criminals, our hearts can be callous, you know, like a, a hard skin covering so that the, the things of Jesus just do not resonate with us. We can be cruel and cold to Jesus. Sometimes we feel that perhaps Jesus was flawed, not understanding how and why he allows things to happen or exist as they do. Or that Jesus has somehow failed us or failed them at the very moment that they thought they needed him the most. And so there is that anger and resentment and bitterness. I, I knew of a, a man many years ago in another town, another community, another county, and I won't say where because we are alive, who because of a tragedy that had occurred, let's just say that his estimation of the Lord God was not very high. And anybody who represented the Lord God was not high on his list. Of course, he came to terms with that and came back to the Lord. He was already saved, but God walked him through that. God was able to take that burden from him, but it was a hard time. And that there was a while that he felt that God had failed him or Christ had failed him. There was bitterness there. There was resentment there. There was anger there. There was deep despair. Just like the sisters of Lazarus. When Lazarus had died, Jesus and his, his disciples, they show up a little bit late. Now, he's right on time, but they thought he was late. I can imagine the two sisters. One doesn't even come out to greet him. She's probably like, I, I can't deal with that right now. You know, we've probably all been there. there uh, the other one, I go out there, I'm hopeful, but you know, Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. In essence, where were you? Certain people, as the Bible says, they receive the word of God eagerly, excitedly. But when hard times come, adversity strikes and sacrifices must be made, they bolt. That experience that they're having does not gel with the expectation they have of Jesus. And because of this failed expectation, they lash out at Jesus even today. He never promised us peace and prosperity in the here and now, although our God is so good, our Savior is so great, that He gives us peace so much. And He gives us that prosperity many, many times over, but He never said it would always be peace and prosperity here and now. And if you're listening to preachers on TV that promise you that, get another preacher. But He did tell us that we were to take up the cross. We were to consider the cost of doing so. We were to follow him down the narrow road and that when the time was right, he would reward our faith and obedience. I'd rather have what's coming than to have immediate fulfillment uh, or immediate satisfaction right here and now. What do we have in common with the thieves at the cross? A lot. Ephesians kind of describes that in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. That is until Jesus changed our life. So yeah. Today, we have opportunity to go and, and to knock on doors and invite them to Easter. Tell them about you, Jesus. Tell them how he has changed your life. When we think about expectations. Give you an example of that real quick. In around 2012, Disney, bought, Disney Corporation bought uh, Lucasfilm, LTD, that means limited, 
And they made big promises they want to expand what is called by many fans the Star Wars franchise. And so they immediately launched into an animated series that's going to be, that was a prequel uh, to the original Star Wars movie. A lot of people liked it. Others like scratched their head a little bit. Then they said, hey, we're going to have three new movies, live action, they're going to pick up where the 1983, the last movie they made, they're going to pick up where they left off. Everybody was excited. So, and we're going to have some standalone movies that kind of tell some stories that just kind of fit in here and there and it's going to be great everybody's all they excited they had great expectations it's going to be a, a, a new day and the first movie came out in 2015 and it was great excitement great disappointment it wasn't the story that most fans expected and some didn't want a lot of the fans got over and said okay it is what it is it's a different interpretation whatever we'll just go on with it but there were some who condemned it to the core and then when they started to put out other TV shows, they condemned all the content. There was nothing good, nothing that, uh, they, no matter what was written, no matter what was shown, they didn't care who the actor was portraying it. They hated it just because. In fact, they got, but they became vicious with it. Actually, character assassination of many of the actors who had been hired to play these parts. I remember reading some of the blogs, just scratching my head like, what is the outlaw people? It's just a movie series. Come on. It's called being a toxic fan. And as I said first thing this morning, the human heart is toxic. The, the ones that would say Hosanna are the same ones when things change who cry, crucify. Let's apply that this morning as time is always waning. Jesus defies expectations in 2024. He does not always accommodate our wishes, our desires, and our assumptions. He will not be labeled, and he will not be limited. Some people are like, well, I trusted Jesus. I'm still having problems. So what's the use? Remember, deliverance is in his time and in his way. So how is he defying your expectations today? Are you willing to come to the crossroads of the cross and trust him, even if you feel disappointed or disillusioned? Because his reality it's so much grander and so much greater than what you and I can imagine or expect. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope, Jeremiah 29, 11. Today, right here, right now, are you a toxic fan? Or are you a faithful follower? Because your eternal destiny rest upon it. But let's diverge. We have come to the cross in convergence, but let's now diverge is going separate ways. The Bible says in Luke 23, but the other answering, see, they have both been cussing Jesus, but something happened, and one of the thieves has a change of mind and a change of heart, and so he, he begins to rebuke the other thief. And that's what we're looking at. Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I like the King James, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Today you will be with me in paradise. So how or why did the two criminals diverge at the cross? They both started out as sinners. They both started out insulting the Lord. But that one thief had a change of heart. The second thief went from being reprobate to regenerate, that is, born again. Perhaps because maybe he recognized in Jesus a forgiving Savior. You know, when Jesus is being nailed, that's an inhumane thing. The nails are being driven through your wrist, also in your feet. It is a painful experience. There's nothing that is, that is kind or, or calm about a crucifixion. It is meant to be a horror. And so as he's doing that, I don't know, if you try to nail something through my wrist, I might have something to say. I'm just enough Irish and I'm just enough Nordic blood in me that I'm probably going to say something to you, okay? Or at least I'm going to holler real loud, one of the two, okay? But Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They are not what they do. The other thief who's already up there and they've been cussing Jesus, but he still sees that. He, he hears that. Jesus did not curse his executioners. He did not he did not shake, well he couldn't shake, but he didn't just shout out against them. 
He fulfilled the very law of God. He also fulfilled his own teaching about the law of God, which is to love your enemy, to love your, uh, to do good to those. In fact, the Bible says in Matthew 5, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, and do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of the Father in heaven. And it comes from Leviticus 19. Don't ever say that the Old Testament has no relativity to the New Testament because it does. Uh, Re Leviticus 19 says, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against any of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You saw a forgiving Savior. But the second thing I think recognized a faithful Savior. He was faithful to God in the most extreme moments of his life. I mean... As he's standing, as he's hanging there, think about Jesus with his dying breath, with pain unimaginable for you and for me. It's almost like it takes a moment. Excuse me, just a minute. John, behold your mother. Woman, behold your son. He's taking care of his biological mother. He is fulfilling the law of God that says, Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. Exodus 20, verse 12. He demonstrates no inconsistency. No superficiality. He's legit. He's true blue. In extremis. That is, to the extreme. And then the second thief revealed a personal faith in the Savior. It's a desperate faith. He asked Jesus to remember him A.T. Robertson says that he's probably thinking in terms of the final judgment to come. That Jesus is the only hope. If there's any hope to be had, Jesus is the only hope he has. It's a decisive faith. Not just a desperate faith. It's a decisive faith. After he has rebuked his other uh, thief, if you will, then he makes a profession, a request by faith. To Jesus as his king, remember me. Just like Joseph was saying to the, to the cupbearer down in the prison. Remember me. I'm an innocent man. And about two to three long years passed before the cupbearer. Oh, by the way, uh, your majesty, you said you had a couple dreams you don't understand. I knew a man when I was in prison. Let me go tell you about him. And then the rest is history. You see, even if that king was currently hanging on the cross, he would soon be seated on the throne. And only Jesus could grant mercy and pardon it's a definitive faith. God's grace was literally being given out by Christ. That man's faith, which is a gift from God, was being placed on Christ and the very work that he was doing, and that sealed the deal. The first thief died in his sin and the hardness of his heart. He went to a devil's hell at the moment for a physical death. But the second thief was given the promise of an immediate conscious fellowship with Jesus after death and the very bliss of heaven, says A.T. Robertson. As we close this this morning, why or how do we diverge at the cross today? So there are two types of hearers today, and only two. There are those who remain hard of heart. They're hard-headed about Jesus. They refuse. They, re uh, they reject the authority of Scripture and all that is revealed about Jesus and all that Jesus reveals uh, of the Father through us. They resist the convicting influence of the Holy Spirit. They maybe even revile it. They are a heartbeat and a breath from eternal separation. Charles Spurgeon once said that the very sun that melts wax also hardens clay. And perhaps you know some people like that today. Pray to God for them that God Almighty will call them to Himself that will break that hardness, that they will come to Jesus, come to their senses, come to salvation. Plead with them. Rebuke their hardness but speak the truth in love. Open hand, not a clenched fist. Weep over them for the Spirit to intervene. But then there are those who do recognize Jesus to be the forgiving and faithful Savior. He truly has always been that, and He is that, and He will be that. And they take Him at His word, and they take Him at His offer. He who has ears to try to him. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Revelation 2.7. Apply that this morning as we think about that divergence. How have you diverged at the cross? Have you remained hardened? If so, reconsider it now. Have you softened and professed your faith in Jesus Christ? If so, rejoice now. Maybe some are straddling the fence today. Well, stop it now. Stop being hard-hearted and stop being hard-headed. 
And if one that you love and know is that way, pray, pray, pray. Plead, plead, plead for them, over them, with them. Dr. Henry Blackaby said that Jesus promised salvation to a criminal. Who do you know that needs that promise of salvation today? Take them to the crossroads of the cross. I believe that that second thief could honestly say with the Apostle Paul, I am crucified with Christ and it it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. And if He were to be the speaker today, about to close, may we all be like this. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The destiny of sinners converge and diverge at the crossroads of the cross. Be certain your direction and the direction of the, the, the divergence is taking you, which we come to the most important moment. We come to the moment where you get to decide. You get to respond to the Holy Spirit. You get to come to the cross where it converges and you do business with Jesus. It may be you just need to come and pray. It may be other decisions that need to be made. I know not what, but I invite you to come to the cross. Let's stand as we sing our hymn of invitation.